Hello guys and gals, me Mudahar, and as you all know, I'm a Linux guy, okay? And every time I make a video about Linux, I always have to talk about how much I despise Windows. I made a video a couple weeks ago where I talked about why you should switch off from Windows, okay? Generally, I use Windows in a virtual machine, and there's a couple reasons for it before anybody goes in, but Muda, you're paranoid. The reason I use software in virtual machines, stuff like Microsoft Windows or Mac OS, is frankly, I need these operating systems to do things like play the latest and greatest games, edit my videos, do a bunch of things. But I know that if I only need it for a couple activities, sometimes it's better to spin up a virtual machine, do my thing for an hour, close the virtual machine, and go back to an operating system that actually is under my control, which is Linux, okay, M various flavors. I use Mac as well. Instead of going to Apple and buying a Mac, I can actually build a better virtual Mac than whatever Apple is selling me and use it to edit videos and do other things. You don't believe me? I've made plenty of videos in the past where I've built the Billy Rig. Now, I actually have another video coming up with the best home build that I've ever come up with, okay, where I've created the ultimate computer, but that's going to be sometime later this month. Now, this video is inspired a lot by Linus Tech Tips, okay? I consider Linus Tech Tips to be one of my favorite channels on YouTube. In fact, when it comes to the tech field out there, these guys are usually pretty awesome. They make good stuff, and it is what it is. Now, Linus made a video series last month, and basically concluding three days ago, where he covered Linux, okay, using it as a daily operating system. Now, if you look over here, he's got some serious views on this, okay? In fact, the first video that came out, 2.4 million views. The second, simple tasks, 2 million almost. Video 2, 1.5, 1 million. Of course, these are views that Linus would expect. But for something Linux-related, this is big. It caused ripples, okay? The Reddit boards were filled with it. The community was all there. I even covered some of this in a couple videos ago. Again, where I was talking about why you should stop using Windows. Now, to understand, Linus wasn't exactly having a great time with this entire endeavor, okay? There were a lot of problems to be had. But I think generally the experiment was good. Now listen, I'm going to start off by saying the Linux community and a small chunk of you, you act like fucking vegans of the computing industry, okay? I'm just going to be real with you. Sometimes when it comes to Linux, people cannot shut up that they use something like Linux. In reality, Linux is just another operating system. Actually, GNU plus Linux, if we're going to be very anal about it. But generally, this is a free open source solution that you and I can download. It comes in various flavors. And once you get it downloaded and ready to go, it might need a little tender love and care. But generally, if you know what you're doing, you can actually get a pretty good computing experience out there. In fact, I would say for most tasks, web browsing, making documents, you know, doing boring stuff, Linux is basically all the way there, okay? But when it comes to niche things like playing video games or editing videos, Linux may not be there entirely. So let's go through this entire video gauntlet and just cover a few points that Linus had made that I really want to granularly get into. Now, the first endeavor starts off with Daily Driver Challenge Part Uno. Now, in this one, both Linus and Luke picked two different Linux distributions. Luke picked Linux Mint, which I would recommend for people who are jumping in. I, it runs really w good on my laptop. No complaints there. Linus went with something called Pop OS. Okay, if you don't know what Pop OS is, it's a Debian-based Linux distribution that uh, seems to be pretty popular with the gamers these days. Now, I've used Pop OS in the past, and generally I've had a fucking dog shit experience with this distribution. Not for the sake of me messing up, but just generally this felt like an inferior OS compared to other Debian-based systems, particularly in the software department. Again, that's just my experience. Linux distributions are like ice cream flavors. Some, some people like certain flavors, some people don't. When I recommend things like Ubuntu in my video, it's because I generally believe that's a pretty easy distribution for people to jump on, install, and use for the general public. Now, in actual Linux usage, I use something called Arch Linux, okay? This is Arch right here. You might have heard it as one of the hardest forms of Linux out there. It's really not. The installation might seem daunting, but in general, I use this because I generally don't like to have a lot of bloat on my system. I just install the software that I need, and I can manage Linux very well, which means as a power user, Arch is absolutely wonderful for me. This has been the stable distribution that I've ever used in my life, okay? But that's a whole story for a different time. For instance, he showcased the installation process as being pretty simplistic, okay? He went through a bunch of next options. I even showed this in my video. Both of them had an easy install process. When it came time to installing certain pieces of software, that's where we had the bombs go off, okay? Pretty well. Oh, hey, there we go. Hello? Oh. 
Oh, wait, what? Did I manage to completely nuke my desktop environment? Like my GUI? See, what's happening over here, chat, is if you look real close, Linus doesn't have a desktop environment anymore. Linus does not have a graphical user interface. This is Linux without any clothes on. Naughty girl that it is. Linus has to enter a login like the old-fashioned days and a password like the old-fashioned days. Right now, he's hitting the world of hackers, except instead of a Gibson, he's basically hacking his brain cells right now, trying to figure out what's going on. And no one should be blaming Linus. I actually saw a few tips about it where, like, ah, Linus is purpose- Linus is perfectly screwing things up on purpose for drama and in reality he did it okay what linus had actually done if we go like 30 seconds back into the video is make a crucial mistake that is often overlooked by people just switching into linux in the first place so here Linus wasn't able to get Steam installed through the graphical user interface. What he did was he actually went into the terminal like we're seeing over here. Now inside this section, it says, yes, do as I say. So Linus has to type this phrase out for Pop! OS to do this massive command, which is install and remove packages. Now we're gonna use some reading over here and read exactly what Linus did wrong. Warning, the following essential packages will be removed. This should not be done unless you know exactly what you are doing. Pop Desktop, Pop Session, Gnome Control, Zorg, GStreamer. If you get rid of these packages, you're going to lose your desktop environment. This explains why 30 seconds ago we saw Linus at a bare naked login shell. Now, of course, it could be helpful if Pop! OS decided, hey, maybe not remove these essential packages. Maybe they should color code this in the terminal to be like full on red. I think anybody that's used to seeing some warnings probably goes through really quickly. I know for Windows stuff, I just generally click yes and go on forward. It happens to the best of us. Linus making this mistake, yes, he didn't read it and he caused himself to have a bad time. But generally, if you're going to make an operating system that's designed for user inter... If you're going to make an OS that's designed for the general public to get in first and get their feet wet, maybe, just maybe, you should put a lot more safeguards into people possibly deleting their desktop environments. And what's basically going on here is some dependency error between programs and packages. That's about it. Now, I'll see this kind of stuff happening in like Arch Linux or Manjaro, but generally less than I would see in like Debian-based operating systems like Ubuntu and Pop! OS. This is something that's probably more Pop! OS related, if I'm going to be honest with my own biases, but this is something that you're probably bound to come across. Now, that said, when you use something like Mac and Windows, I don't believe Windows allows people to just delete their desktop environment. Unless certain applications could delete explorer.exe out of nowhere and prevent you from accessing the start menu, that would be bad design. That would be a bad time. That would actually be a security issue. Same with Mac. If Mac allowed any application to delete its desktop environment and all of a sudden Granny's trying to figure out where the beach ball is, we're going to have a bad time. This is something that Linux can allow you to do. And while it's kind of cool from a power user perspective, obviously for somebody new jumping in, you can imagine how this is gonna be frustrating. Now, Luke didn't have this time with Linux Mint, so he had a much more easier experience as far as I was able to see. And of course, Linus actually made this work for himself in the end by switching to another distribution known as Manjaro, one that I've shown you in the past. And of course, he probably should have used this to begin with, but it highlights an issue, is that with Linux, unless you're using the right maintained distributions, sometimes you'll have an issue with one distro that probably won't be reflected in the others. And this is an issue, this is something that needs to be fixed, but I'm glad they actually showcased this. Now, of course, moving on to the next video in this entire situation was trying to do simple tasks on Linux. Now, this is a really interesting video where Linus and Luke covered how to do simple tasks, not gaming, not nothing. Things like making Word documents, compressing files, moving files between folders, uh, taking screenshots of your desktop, you know, basic shit. And basically they gave each other 15 minutes to do each task. And for the most part, each of them did their tasks really well. The real difference in this entire video was how Linus and Luke challenged themselves and how differently they did tasks. Linus, for instance, did tasks entirely different than Luke did, especially when it came to like signing PDFs. Linus was trying to do it the right way by finding cryptographic keys. Luke found the awesome way of just copy pasting an image onto another image, which, hey, for the most part works real well. Okay, goddamn. Now, I think this is really cool. In order for you to sell Linux to people, you have to be able to do basic stuff like this. And it was interesting seeing them actually succeed. For instance, they even got a printer working absolutely flawlessly, which even under Windows, may I remind you, causes me some grief. 
But generally, this is where Linux is right now. If you're not doing stuff that's niche, you're probably gonna have a generally good time utilizing Linux and probably not even identifying the key differences between Windows, Mac, or Linux in the first place. Remember, for the average Andy out there that has no idea about what's going on in their computer, if you honestly gave them the same wallpaper amongst all three operating systems, and you gave them a web browser that's open, I honestly believe that somebody that's computer illiterate will actually identify between each three operating system until, of course, they're actually installing pieces of software, which even in that case can be questionable. Now, now, a while back, obviously in that Ubuntu video where I showed you where you shouldn't use Windows, I showed you how to download Steam and Discord from the web interface, from the web app, from the actual web browser, and install it that way. Now, that's the wrong way to do it, okay? Now, the reason I showed it to you like that was generally, if you're going to be installing software on your operating system, it has to be pretty fucking easy. For instance, with Mac, which I believe is the gold standard of ease of use, all you have to do is go to Steam, for instance, on a Mac, download the DMG file, click on it on your download folder, copy the Steam to the application folder. Sometimes they even have a cool graphic in the installer to make it super easy. Then you run Steam and you install your games. Honestly, it does not get easier than that. With Windows, you download an EXE file, you launch it, and you call it a day. The right way to install Steam, for instance, on a Linux device would be to open up a terminal would be to type sudo, for instance, sudo being the super user command. Pacman, Pacman in this case is the package manager. For something like Ubuntu, you would use apt, but I am using Arch Linux, so Pacman is mine. Then you give it an argument like dash capital S for you know installing the package, and then space type in Steam. So of course you pass your root address because you're doing a system wide change. Then you install Steam the right way, okay? Now again, for somebody who's new to the entire system, this might look daunting already, but that's something that Linux has covered for you. There's a lot of applications like Discover, for instance, where you could open up a GUI, type in the word Steam, and install it that way, okay? And it's pretty simple to manage things in this fashion. You want to install Discord? Same thing right here. Change Steam to Discord. And if the package exists, you can, oh yeah, terminate that. You can download Discord just as you would easily. In fact, this is ideal because usually when you install packages like downloading an EXE file from a website on Windows, you may subject yourself to things like MITM attacks or potentially downloading that same software, but with a little added malware. This is software you're downloading from a repository that's been checked by people for malware. So this is the safest way to do things. Of course, to somebody who's jumping in, they might consider this confusing. But that's the thing with the command line. It might seem hackerish, but once you figure out how these commands work, once you've done things enough, this will all start gelling with you. That's not to say this is the easiest, smartest way to do things. So when it comes to installing operating systems and dealing with things, this is another thing I wanted to cover. Windows is a gold standard, okay? Basically all you do is you go to Microsoft's website, download the ISO file, burn it to a flash drive, put it into a computer, install it, click a few times, and it's good to go. Driver-wise, Windows will fetch them from their update servers, and if it doesn't, you can go to the vendor for the hardware that you have, download a driver, and generally it works. Windows' solution is ideally what you want for a system that, uh, frankly, for, for systems that come in various different, you know, um, permutations, right? Various different graphic cards, processors, whatever you want to call it. This is a system that works. People can easily do things. It's sometimes better than what Linux offers. Now, of course, with Linux, a lot of the stuff is built into the kernel itself. So when you install Linux, and let's say you want to use a PlayStation 4 controller, right? You connect it with a flash drive, or sorry, not a flash drive, but a USB connection to your computer, and suddenly it just works, literally out of the box. Seriously, go try it for yourself. You can even use a little touchpad as a mouse, uh, as a little mouse thing. So generally, Linux does have things for it. Now, of course, certain pieces of hardware may be so unique that you probably do need to download drivers. And Linux usually has that covered. There's a guide somewhere available. But in cases like that, nobody can say that it's as easy as Windows. See, for this to work and for this to be more widely accepted, Linux has to become easier. I generally think for Linux to win in a lot of cases is to have a distribution that's as easy to manage and install as Windows. And that may not be something that's readily available for a while. 
And I think for the community watching in the Linux camp, if you want people to jump into this world, you need to make it as easy as you can. When it comes to user interfaces, the easier it is, the better, okay? Calling somebody a troglodyte because they managed to fuck something up on Linux is not the answer, okay? If Granny is trying to install software and she messes it up because the user interface wasn't clear with her, that's the UI fault, okay? That's the OS fault. If you're gonna design software, okay, it has to basically work, all right? It has to be as painless for the user as possible in order to help adoption, okay? That's generally the vibe that I go with. And hey, look, with Windows 10, I hate the fact that every time I update key system components, I'm basically blanked out to a giant blue screen looking at this fucking spinning wheel. With Linux, there's obviously the benefit of typing in this one command, on depending on what distribution you use, obviously, and updating your whole goddamn system with ease in the background while you actually use your computer for productive tasks, like record videos. So, look at that, bam, hit yes, it's basically updating the whole system in the background, minimize, call it a day. And yes, it'll actually update the entire system components in the background as well, and it'll only activate them once you restart the package or restart Linux itself. Again, as hassle-free as possible. Now in part two, Linus and Luke started to use software that was uh, a little bit unsupported, software that was more gaming oriented, things like the NVIDIA X server settings. And actually, I think this video, they could have went a little harder, but obviously they use things like OBS, which is exactly what I'm using to record this video right now. And it works just like you would on a Windows PC anyways. They also tried using software like Discord and whatnot, and basically all the stuff that gamers would use anyway, Steam, Discord, you call it. And generally, I think it's cool. I think it works. I think it's awesome. I think what they were doing was a general good idea. These are pieces of software that you and me as gamers are probably going to use. And for the most part, things work. Obviously, the way that they install software was a little bit different, a little hazy, but generally they had a pretty solid experience covering this. Now, I think this video didn't do it complete justice, okay? For instance, let's say you do have an NVIDIA graphic card. I have both AMD and NVIDIA in my system. If you're using Linux, AMD is the better solution, okay? A lot of their stuff is built right into the kernel. But if you have an NVIDIA graphic card, you should get the same experience, okay? Generally, Linux is a platform that allows you to be more open and free. And if it comes to the point where Windows has a better experience for one graphic card versus Linux, that's not a good thing. But let's look at Linux for a second. Here's the NVIDIA settings, right? Here, you can get an idea of your thermal systems. You can get an idea of like, you know, the power that you're consuming. And generally, if you're using things like G-Sync and whatnot, a lot of these features work in Linux out of the box. What doesn't work underneath in Linux out of the box in certain cases can be things, and I'm not joking with you, things like HDR. If you have a higher end monitor, you're not gonna be able to use HDR underneath Linux. It just doesn't work at the moment. Things like G-Sync work just fine. Things like DLSS work now with some tinkering. DLSS is a huge feature for NVIDIA graphic cards. It allows you to get better frame rates without sacrificing a lot of that visual cost. But things like ray tracing then come into the question where it depends on how certain games run it. For instance, if the game uses Vulkan for ray tracing, it works under Linux just fine. If it uses DXR or a DirectX version, Right now, it's in infancy. You can ray trace underneath Linux, but it's not a perfect experience. It's really a game by game basis. So what I think is a really great experience here and a really good example is this is Resident Evil Village running underneath Linux. Now I've got VKD3D, which allows me to actually enable things like ray tracing, which I have right here. Now to show you the real issue sometimes and why it's game by game basis is as we load into the game over here, which of course it runs fine. Like we are getting a full 60 frames. The only reason it's hitching right now is because I'm recording the screen and it causes some issues. But here you can see that the BVH isn't even being rendered properly, like the actual ray tracing is just not working. It's almost as if the game's failing in this regard. And it's not because my computer is incapable. This is a 3090. So again, if you can look at it real quickly by turning off ray tracing, which again, we enable through experimental versions of VKD3D, which is translating DirectX 12 to Vulkan, now it suddenly works when I turn off ray tracing, like it, the actual game renders properly. So again, depending on how recent the game is, how it handles ray tracing, you may have a decent experience or you may not. Whereas on Windows 10 or 11, it just works out of the box, obviously, because that's what the software is designed for.
There's also stuff like NVIDIA GeForce Experience and AMD Radeon Relive, which are graphic card tools that have a whole bunch of features tossed into them that allow you to change the clock speeds of your cards or use onboard recording software and streaming software, which just doesn't work on Linux at the moment. There's also software like NVIDIA Broadcast that uses the AI chip on it to actually blur the screen out, maybe remove the background from your face cam and do cool things like that. That doesn't work underneath Linux at the moment natively. Now in the last video, Linus titled it, Gaming on Linux is not ready. Now of course with a title like that, it means some serious business. And you know, He's kind of not wrong. Let's cover into exactly what's happened. So Linus basically gives you the entire idea of playing a bunch of games on Steam, you know, but he also mentions that while Steam is doing a real good job of supporting Linux, there's a little bit of a problem. Obviously Valve has said when the Steam Deck drops, which is running on Linux, is going to have 100% compatibility with Steam games. They're not including games that you'd find on Epic, which there's a lot of exclusives. They're not mentioning games directly off of Uplay or uh, things like EA Origins or various other game launchers out there. See, Linux in that case isn't exactly the best solution. If you're running games off Steam, it's as usually as easy as going onto Steam, downloading the file and hitting play. Usually if the game doesn't have a shady anti-cheat or a very invasive DRM, usually it just works out of the box. For instance, I was able to play Death Stranding just fine underneath Linux. I was able to play Resident Evil 2 just fine under Linux. I was able to play a lot of games just fine under Linux. Of course, when anti-cheat gets dropped in, that's an issue. But look, listen, let's say you wanted to play something. I'm going to give you a good example. Let's play you want. Let's say you wanted to play something like uh, Assassin's Creed Origin. Now, I didn't buy Assassin's Creed Origin off of Steam. I bought it off Ubisoft Connect. Okay, I figured, hey, if I'm going to have to stick two condoms on to play this game, I might as well just buy the one I need, which is Ubisoft's own launcher. So I can't just go to Ubisoft Connect like I am right now and download it for Linux. It doesn't have Linux support, okay? So if I download it for PC, it's literally giving me an exe file. I can't just use this, okay? So what I need to do is I'm going to use a third-party launcher like Lutris, which is a front end for something known as Wine. I'm going to be using this to help run games from Windows that require launchers and various dependencies easily on Linux. So here I'm going to type in Assassin's Creed Origins, okay? Which, if you look real quickly, and if the site works, you can find that, yeah, they actually have the option right there. So I'm going to click Origins, and here you can see that they've got some patches ready to go. So they have a Steam version for you to just, you know, if you want the Steam version running through Lutris, to work this way. Now the Wine version, which was last published one year and 11 months ago, two years almost. Now I can just hit the little Install button, open the link, and all of a sudden, Lutris will fire up real quick, and I can actually start installing Assassin's Creed Origins. So I'm going to hit install, go through this rabbit hole right here, and as long as I follow the instructions, you know, provided the script still works, it should install Assassin's Creed Origins, and I should be able to play this game just like I would on a Windows system. That is, of course, if an update didn't break it. For instance, I was able to play GTA 5 just fine underneath Linux. The problem was, now it's not that GTA 5 is broken, it's the fucking Rockstar Launcher. Okay, so when the Rockstar Launcher wasn't broken, for a while I couldn't connect to my friends on GTA Online. So yeah, if a game updates in a way where it breaks the Linux experience, you really have to hope somebody in the community can fix up a script or maybe fix up some dependency, or hope. and. Hope blindly that the developer chooses to make it easier for Linux, which they almost never will, because Linux's market share is so small that a lot of developers may choose not to even bother wasting their time. If it works under Proton, congratulations Linux guys, you get to play it. If it doesn't, don't hold your breath out for any developer jumping in to fix it. Frankly, the market cap is so low and the money they would make is so low that understandably it's not worth the hassle. And it sucks to hear that, but it is just unfortunately the reality of the situation. Now, what about games that are super duper popular? Now, I'm not here to say that Twitch TVs, like top stream games, are indicative of like the popularity of actual video games. But if we look at Twitch right now and just go to browse for a second, let's look at some of the top games at the moment. So let's go viewers high to low. Now, of course, if we skip just chatting, Escape from Tarkov unplayable on Linux because of the anti-cheat battle eye at the moment. It just does not work. You won't really be connecting to games as far as I know. 
GTA 5 works underneath Linux, of course, provided Rockstar's launcher doesn't break. League of Legends does not work underneath Linux. Valorant does not work underneath Linux. Genshin Impact maybe works underneath Linux with a weird install script, but not natively supported. It has kernel anti-cheat, which is usually incompatible. Apex Legends does not work. Warzone does not work. Slots, oh God. Fortnite does not work out of the box. Minecraft, yes it does. Five Nights at Freddy's, yes it does. World of Warcraft, I think it does. ASMR, oh it definitely does. Dead by Daylight, probably. FF, obviously, but you can understand what I'm getting at with. A lot of games in this list, especially the ones that are most played right now, the most popular, usually what your homies are playing, do not work natively underneath Linux. And that's because of crappy anti-cheat. Now anti-cheat is a component for video games that it's required, you know, just to prevent as many hackers as you can. PC gamers are real naughty when it comes to that. But a lot of these anti-cheats are just incompatible with Linux. And there's probably a good chance the, most, the more invasive an anti-cheat is, the more incompatible it is with the entire Linux kernel as a whole. So there are a couple fixes to this, dual boot Windows, but that would be using Windows natively and that's not something I like to do. The other option is don't play those games. Again, you know, it's not feasible for most people. Most gamers may want to try some Valorant. They may want to try some Apex. Simply quitting these games shouldn't be an option. It shouldn't need to be an option. The third option, and this is what I do, is run a graphic pass-through virtual machine. Now, I've made videos in the past where I've passed through a graphic card to Windows virtual machines and played games as if they were natively running underneath Windows. Some people have said this is like a cheat. This is a little bit of a, you know, hack. This is not something that you should, it's not real gaming Muda underneath Linux if you're using Windows. Which, to be honest, I'm going to say fuck you, okay? At the end of the day, if you're gaming underneath the Linux kernel in any capacity, it's still gaming underneath Linux, all right? Granted, it's a much more, uh, you know, comprehend it's it's a much more complicated solution i agree i admit but it's not something that's impossible it's the beauty of linux you can do a lot with it and if you know what to do you can make it bend to you if you really try now in terms of virtualizing windows underneath linux it's also becoming a situation where it's not exactly ideal games are coming with more kernel level anti-cheats and with kernel level anti-cheats they're preventing virtual machine users from even joining the games for instance, you can't play Valorant right now at the moment. You also can't play games like Rainbow Six Siege underneath the virtual machine unless you hide things really well. But then you're risking a ban. In fact, here's a little bonus. Here's Rainbow Six Siege running underneath Linux just fine through Proton. You can see the game renders correctly and it actually doesn't appear to have any graphical issues. Of course, this is with the anti-cheat disabled. The anti-cheat is not able to run underneath Proton or any of these compatibility layers. Again, unless Ubisoft patches it in or allows it, which apparently seems to be a possibility, we're going to be sitting here without Rainbow Six Siege playable <laughs> online. I guess until Ubisoft or Easy or sorry, BattleEye flips the switch, which who knows if or when that'll ever be. You also can't play certain titles like Genshin Impact without hiding your hypervisor in some ways. But then you're also killing performance. So there's a billion gotchas to deal with. But this is the route you have to go if you're willing to use Linux as a daily driver. Look, no one said this entire situation was ever going to be easy. But most of these things usually aren't. I'm not here to say Linux has some god-tier difficult operating system to learn and use, but it's got some problems ahead of it. For right now, niche cases like video editing, like, you know, playing the newest, latest, and greatest games, Linux is not number one in that regard at all. If you're doing things like development, web development, you know, real basic stuff, Linux is already there, okay? But for a lot of these niche cases, yeah, watching that Linus series makes a lot of sense. And all the drama that would generate from it because Linus maybe messed up a few things or he wasn't successful is necessarily not even his fault. Listen, he's a guy that's trying to show people the average Andy experience of Linux. People who are going to sit here on video and say, oh, but all you had to do was modify just one file or you had to introduce one command. Listen. We know this because we've used this for years. I know I can work my way around a terminal, but most average people shouldn't need to bring up a terminal. They shouldn't need to open up a GitHub. They shouldn't need to compile software in order to use their operating system 
in the most basic of manners. Things should just work out of the box. Graphical user interfaces should just exist for a lot of these tasks anyways. There's no reason why Windows and Mac is so user accessible and Linux, in certain cases, can absolutely cause people to lose hair. It just shouldn't be that way. But then again, I'm going to leave this video right here where it's at. I think Linus' series was good, and frankly, I wanted to really air out my entire grievances in this situation, too. I wanted to give my take. I wanted to cover a lot of these Linux, you know, hooplas in my own fashion. So let me know what you thought about this video in the comment section below. If you like what you saw, please like, comment, and subscribe. Dislike it if you dislike it. I am out.